Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Today's speaker is one of our uh, soon-to-be graduating third-year residents in the pediatric program, Dr. Ilea <laughs> Bolez. I was trying desperately to pronounce it the right way. Um, uh, Dr. Bolez came to us from uh, Egypt, where he trained uh, as a pediatrician and worked for some time in Egypt and Kuwait prior to relocating here to redo his uh, residency. On completion, he will be moving to Galax to join a private practice group. Please welcome Dr. Bolez. Thank you. Uh, welcome to our grand round. Thank you all for coming today. So today, uh, our topic will be critical inpatient and outpatient care for pediatric transplantation patients. And I have a nice story from Middle East from my previous experience. So. Uh, the topic would be like four sections. First uh, section, I'm going to present the case from uh, Middle East. It's a very challenging case regarding a patient with uh, recent renal transplantation. And then we will discuss the hematopoietic uh, uh, stem cell transplantation, then solid organ transplantation. Then the last part will be what's the role of general pediatrician to deal with patients of uh, transplantation. And there'll be like transition uh, slides was from ancient Egypt. <laughs> So uh, the case, like we had a case in our PQ at Jahra Hospital. This was in Kuwait, uh, 2015. So she was five years old, female, presented with a status epilepticus. She had like abnormal behavior. She was very irritable, episodes of screaming and crying and poor feeding for three days. Then she had the high-grade fever and severe itching for two days. Then she had decreased activity and diarrhea like three times per day, no, no blood, no mucus, and non-bilious, non-bloody uh, vomitus for one day. So uh, she has very significant past medical history. She had end-stage renal disease due to bilateral renal dysplasia, and uh, she had had a renal transplantation from a deceased donor three months ago. So home medication, she was in sacrolimus, sacrolimus and mycophenolate mofetil, and cutrimoxazole, GAN, cyclovir, amlodipine, folic acid, and magnesium. She had normal development, full vaccination, and her uh, family history was irrelevant. So by examination, she has like uh, very fast heart rate, respiratory rate, her blood pressure were, was high, and her temperature was 38.5 Celsius, and she was very agitated. She, was, uh, she had very aggressive behavior, like she scratched three nurses. She had extensive scratch marks on her, lip edema, finger alterations, bilateral conjunctival injection and excessive oral secretion. Her chest, she had like bilateral equal entry, no problems. Her heart was doing fine. Her abdomen, she had like a liver that was three centimeters below costal margin and her gastroscopy tube were working fine. Neurologically, her glass coma scale was just eight over 15. She had bilateral constricted sluggish pupils and generalized hypertonia and hyperreflexia with abnormal movements and minimal stimulation. <laughs> So, you know, the differential diagnosis of altered mental status, we do vitamins, we did it there, we did it here. So vitamin vascular, like stroke, migraines, infection, meningitis, toxins, accident, abuse, metabolic, intersusception, but not in this case, neoplasm, and seizures. But in her case in particular, because she was a transplant patient, so we said, like, she had a picture of encephalopathy versus encephalitis. So we said maybe encephalitis, maybe due to immunosuppression, she was on a lot of immunosuppressive drugs. And she maybe TMV encephalitis, HSV encephalitis, or cryptococcal meningitis. And she was hypertensive, maybe she was hypertensive encephalop encephalopathic, or uremic encephalopathic, because maybe there's some sort of graft rejection. We are going to discuss all of this in the, in the in presentation. And maybe drug toxicity, or electrolyte disturbance, because she had a significant gastroenteritis, or graft related infection, but usually this is not very acute, it's six times, like HIV or EBV. So uh, workup, her CBC was not, uh, was, no, was not significant for anything. CMP, so sometimes we do millimoles in Kuwait, so, but the uh, only thing that was abnormal is her AC, ALT, LDH, and CK. And we said maybe because of the seizures and continuous convulsion, she was in a status, but like her kidney functions was fine. Uh, beyond and creatine, this in millimole and micromole, but this is normal. And sodium was 132. This will not give you a convulsion or status epilepticus. Her venous blood gases were, were fine. Uh, so of course, we did CT brain, and it was normal. We did CSF for her. So it has a wide blood cell count. It was nine. 
But the mo mo monos were like 90%, was like a weird thing for us. <coughs> the protein was fine, but in like weight, many more <laughs> measures. And uh, the, uh, every, uh, the culture was negative. And we did virology studies, like for a good panel, like include CMV, EPV, and she was CMV positive with PCR like 9,834. So we said, yeah, maybe the, the, our working diagnosis for her was like CMV encephalitis. Day one, she was intubated. She was ventilated to protect her airway for better control of convulsions. Then the convulsions were controlled with the Kepra, phenobarbitone, or Lefetiracetam, phenobarbitone, Medazolam infusion. But she continued to show like abnormal movement to minimal stimulation. We started like big guns for her, like meropenem, ticoplanin, which is very, uh, very like good uh, medication for gram-positive organisms, including MRSA, GAN cyclovir for the possible CMV encephalitis, and amphotericin B for possible fungal infections. So blood pressure was hard to control with amlodipine and hydralazine, but unfortunately the patient developed sudden cardiac arrest and passed away on day three. But this is not the end of the story. Like, of course, during her stay, we, we con uh, contacted the transplant center in uh, Kuwait City, and like they were checking on the other recipient. So the second kidney recipient had developed similar symptoms and died a week later. And the heart recipient had died after cardiac arrest with some neuropsychiatric symptoms. And the microbiology studies failed to identify any organism in both patients. Records showed that the deceased donor was 28 years old Indian male who presented with chest infection and seizures. And the CT head and CSF culture of the donor were unremarkable. Anybody has any clue what's going with this kid? Okay, so we'll see, like somewhere at India, so the, actually the transplant, the transplant center contacted the deceased donor's family. So the family confirmed that he was bitten by a domestic dog in India while he was in vacation two months prior to his death in Kuwait. Like he was in vacation, he went to Kuwait, he was bit by the dog, bitten by the dog, and he came back to Kuwait and he died in Kuwait. And he, of course he didn't, have a, he didn't get any prophylaxis and actually they asked what happened to the dog and the dog died soon after he bit by the, the fish. Do you know what's happening right now? Exactly. So the cause of this, of his death was just pneumonia, sepsis, and seizures. So there was some patients that got the transplant in Saudi Arabia. So they contacted them also, like the liver recipient developed drooling and hydrophobia and died after 34 days. And mortem brain biopsy showed negri bodies. Rabies RNA was detected in brain and saliva of the patient. And there was like two corneas for two different patients in Saudi Arabia that was explanted. And, but they patients, they get their prophylaxis and they remained well. They didn't die. <laughs> so the corneas were sent to CDC in Atlanta, and rabies was confirmed, confirmed in the donor's explanted corneas by PCR, and the rabies strain is known to be endemic around India, Nepalese, and Pakistani borders in this area. So I did some research, like it, it, this case was published like in 2017, it happened in 2015, then I came here in 2016, and it was published in 2017. Of course, they published this case, but this not, does not, didn't only happen in Kuwait. Like, at least there is like 10 reported rabies outbreaks in transplant patients. The last one in the United States was in 2013 in Maryland, and the donor was bit by a raccoon. So the last one documented in literature, it was in China, it was in 2016 and 2017. So it keeps happening. Very hard. So I, I picked this case because it's, it's of course, like, very overwhelming, very, like, stressing, just to understand how fragile and overwhelmed are those patients. So uh, first, the first section we are going to do is hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, but first I will introduce you the Dr. Hisira. This is the earliest known physician ever. He was like, his first record was in 2645 BC. He was double boarded in medicine and dentistry. <laughs> it's mentioned in the record. <laughs> And he was, uh, he was the first one in history to like, describe uh, diabetes, uh, and he said it's frequent urination. So uh, hematobiotic stem cell transplantation, you know, like it's, it's a simple definition. It's like infusing blood stem cells from a donor to a recipient. So and there's like different types. So if we go from down to syngenic, it's like you are doing between ident identical twins. And by the, by the, by, uh, this was the first time, like in 1956, the first uh, stem cell transplantation was between identical twins in 1956. Autologous, if the donor and the recipient are the same person. 
and allogenic if the donor and recipient are different people, and of course there's like fully matched if related donation can come from usually siblings, <coughs> rarely parents. If, if it's a parent, usually there is a history of consanguinity. And unrelated, if uh, sometimes it comes from like uh, umbilical cord blood banks or if there is a living donor. So sources you can like collect, because there are three main sources, like brain st uh, uh, stem cells from uh, bone marrow, from peripheral blood, or from umbilical cord or placental units. So of course, the, you know, the human leuco leukocyte antigens, HLAs, need to be tested for major histocompatibility loci. So we have class A, which A, B, and C, and class 2, D, R, D, Q, and I think this D, P, O. At least six loci routinely are analyzed for umbilical cord blood bank, but usually eight to 10 for lived donor products other than the umbilical cords. So epidemiology, like uh, there is like a huge rise in the trend of uh, stem cell transplantation, like uh, in 2012, there was like worldwide more than 2,000 cases, but this keeps increasing, and the trends are affected by improvement in supportive care, of course, including dealing with graft versus host, uh, prevention and treatment, and donor availability. Now there's like umbilical cord uh, blood banks and uh, registries, there's like expanded lift donor programs, and the reduced intensity conditioning like especially for the cases that not malignant, like KID or hemoglobinopathies, and halo, uh, haplo identical stem cell, like this comes from first degree relatives, usually mothers, and of course because there is like now new techniques just, uh, such as like cyclophosphamide infusion. So types, as we said, like we have the bone marrow, peripheral blood, and uh, uh, umbilical cord blood. So bone marrow, it's like the most common, it uh, usually needs anesthesia. The donor will be in, in bone size, and you will collect the, the stem cells from the iliac crest. It has advantages of high engraftment rates and low rates of uh, chronic uh, graft versus host. But disadvantages like uh, pain for the donor, sometimes you cannot find like uh, very uh, uh, identical uh, donor. For the peripheral blood, uh, you need like to give uh, colony stimulating factor for three to five days and put the donor in a pharesis machine. And then uh, it has the advantage of high engraftment rate also and uh, uh, higher stem cell yield. But sometimes the disadvantage will be like there is high ra higher rates from chronic graft versus host disease. For umbilical cord, this is the easiest one to collect, but sometimes it's not very sufficient, but it's very good, like the patient usually does not have any viral infection, and it's, it's good also uh, lower rates for graft versus host disease. So indications like malignant diseases, of course, if there's like, uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, especially very, very high risk patients, or relapsed disease, acute myeloid leukemia in high risk features, not re and relapsed disease, myelodysplastic syndromes, non-Hodgkin lymphomas, Hodgkin lymphomas, some uh, current research for uh, solid tumors like Ewing, Ewing sarcoma, of course in high-risk neuroblastoma, and sometimes in brain tumors uh, if, if you would like to avoid the radiation for the brain, growing brain. Uh, indication for non-malignant disease, so you need like to make a balance. So if, if the phenotype is very severe, and there is like an available donor, this can, this can be a very good solution, especially for cases with primary immunodeficiency, such as severe combined immunodeficiency skid or X-linked chronic granulomatous disease with good Aldrich syndrome. And uh, this is the common examples for it. Uh, it can help prevent neurological and neurologic progression in metabolic diseases because of the replacement of the deficient enzymes in the monocytes. And this usually takes like months for the monocytes to migrate from the bone marrow to the CNS. So some indications, of course, like primary immune deficiency, especially of severe phenotype, and hemoglobinopathy, thalassemia major, sickle cell disease. Of course, if there is like inherited bone marrow failure syndrome, the Fanconi anemia, severe aplastic anemia, diamond black fan anemia, all the uh, aplastic anemias, and a lot of metabolic genetic disorders like osteopetrosis, used to be like a fatal disease, mucopolysaccharidosis, you can like make a balance between like giving the enzyme infusion or doing the, the transplant, depends on the availability of the donor. And uh, then also like leukodystrophies uh, and other miscellaneous like such as Gaucher disease or Neiman-Beck disease, a lot of indications.
So what are the risks? So of course there is like acute and long-term toxicities as we saw with our patients. Uh, so uh, the risk depends on the conditioning. Its intensity is like myeloablative in the malignant disease or uh, reduced intensity conditioning in non-malignant disease. Of course, if there is like pre-existing comorbidities, prior chemotherapy exposure, and of course the stem cell resource uh, source, and uh, all of this influence the risk of complication and transplant-related mortality. But in general, it's better in children uh, than in adults. So uh, usually, uh, uh, the transplant-related mortality is just between 5% and 10%. So one of the most common complications is infections or immune reconstitution. So the neutrophil engraftment typically occurs like two to three weeks after the transplant. The natural killers usually after one month. And T cell function, like we impair it by intent, like especially during periods of the prophylaxis, like in the beginning, or therapy of graft, uh, graft versus host disease. But for those like uh, who stop the prophylaxis against the graft versus host disease, Usually, they uh, do the switch, the lymphocyte <coughs> switching from IgG to IgM, usually from six to eight months. So, of course, like bacteremia, sepsis, and fungal infection are frequent, particularly during the neutropenic phase, the first three weeks. And, of course, our, uh, respiratory viruses such as RSV and adenovirus can be like devastated in, this, in, in the immunocompromised state. And primary infection uh, or reactivation of CMV or EBV uh, is like a lot of guidelines, international and institutional guidelines, how to, to do surveillance, how to catch this early. And of course, you know, ABV, like it's very simple virus, in the immunocompetent patient can give you mononucleosis, but in those patients it can give you lymphoproliferative disorders which can range from benign disease to lymphomas and leukemia. A cyclovir prophylaxis sometimes indicated in patients with HSV1 seropositive patients, and usually like for one year or something after the transplant, and it gives some uh, protection against varicella zoster virus. Uh, there's what's called BK virus, can cause hemorrhagic cystitis, especially for, uh, for the kids with renal transplant. We'll discuss this later. And renal dysfunction, uh, pneumocysts, also uh, usually there will be like some prophylaxis during the immunosuppression uh, suppression period. And of course, there is like a lot of uh, guidelines from the CDC how to deal with neutropenia. Usually it looks like our supine neutropenic patients, like if you have a kid with fever, usually uh, you will check like with CBC. Blood culture covers them with CFP, 50 milligram per kg every eight hours. But there's like tons of guidelines available. And then of course, like the immunization, sometimes the timing of live uh, attenuated viruses, you need like there is also guidelines for when to start or not to start live uh, attenuated uh, vaccines. Mucositis is like uh, happens almost in all children. It's direct toxicity, like uh, especially with the case of neutropenia, it can happen anywhere from uh, like mouse to uh, to the rectum, and it, it can induce translocation of bacteria or secondary HSV1 fungal infections. Usually, it it needs like narcotics, uh, something like magic uh, mouse wash, a lot of uh, treatment, nutritional support. So. This usually uh, improves with the improvement of neutrophilic count. Nutritional support, as we said, like a lot of them, a lot of the kids directly after the transplant will have decreased intake, a lot of nausea, anorexia, malabsorption, mucosites, and they have increased metabolic needs because of the catabolic state, which is like uh, malignancy or immune deficiency or current infection. So usually they need some sort of enteral feeding. Enteral feeding is like uh, most preferred, uh, very preferred, more preferred than the uh, IV uh, parenteral nutrition because this like will give benefits to the liver by promoting biliary flow. This will avoid something like sinusoidal obstructive syndrome and polypharmacy in graft versus host disease. There's what's called sinusoidal obstructive syndrome. It's like serious hepatic toxicity seen one to ten of patients depends on the center and uh, it happens uh, because of like injury of usually it happens if there's like pre-existing liver disease or allogenic transplant or high-risk neuroplastoma, or if you if use like busulfan or cyclophosphamide treatment. It involves occlusion of sinusoidal venules due to microthrombi, and then the liver will be swollen, painful, then we'll see fluid retention, cholestasis. Actually, we have a patient with acute, acute myeloid leukemia. She developed sinusoidal obstructive syndrome, and we are dealing with her 
So she's, uh, if the case is mild or moderate, we deal with diuresis, but our patient was severe also, so we do dermatite <coughs> with like promising results. So pulmonary complications between infection, volume overload, uh, sometimes also we will have like pneumonites from the alkylating agent, idiopathic pneumonia syndrome, and chronic graft versus host disease. So respiratory failure uh, that needs intubation and ventilation usually with poor prognosis than the usual patient. So the main thing is like graft versus host disease. It's, it's a big deal. It can be acute, it can be chronic. So for acute graft versus host disease, so what happens like the immune, it's immune-based complications like it's antigen exposure and there's a donor T cells because you infuse donor T cells, so the, the infused the donor T cells like attack the recipient tissues. Usually the acute one is like skin, GI, and liver because they have the, the they are rich in antigen presenting cells. So, uh, and GI can happen from colon uh, to stomach to duodenum. So there is like a lot of staging system like for each uh, like system and for the uh, overall picture and depends on it like you, you decide to treat this with corticosteroids or you can add more uh, medication. This is the acute. The chronic graft versus host disease like it happens like months after the transplant, usually around six months. And it can be a devastating complication. We have an attending uh, uh, in our uh, pediatric floor. Uh, he, he used to say, like, you are replacing one disease with another disease. Like, the main disease is to replace, especially if you develop chronic graft versus host. It's like a very uh, devastating disease. Looks like, clinically, it looks like systemic lupus or systemic sclerosis. Usually results in dry eyes, dry mouth, fatigue, debilitating skin, muscle joint, liver, gut, and lung disease. Usually, uh, it needs prolonged immune suppression. And uh, you do prolonged immune suppression, this will uh, result in opportunistic infections, more uh, incidence of opportunistic infections, and it's like it has also in the organ dysfunction, usually the lung and liver. And chronic graft, as we said, it replaces the original disease. So for those who develop graft versus host, once the graft versus host is inactive or for a sufficient period of time, we can start like weaning the immune suppression and see what's going to happen. Of course, there is like uh, complex protocols for this. But because of there is like a tolerance between the donor T cells and the recipients, usually uh, it's not expected to receive a lifelong immune suppression unless you develop like severe chronic graft versus host disease. This is unlike the solid organ transplantation, which usually needs lifelong immune suppression. And we, I have a slide like to compare between both of this at the end of the talk. So there's like a lot of screening recommendations for the latest fix, like this between the primary care physician and the transplant centers. Like for example, here for iron overload, usually we do like annual serum ferritin. If it's elevated, you do like an MRI, and of course the management will be chelation or phlebotomy, as it's like tons. Then like renal, pulmonary, cardiac, metabolic, thyroid, like there's like huge deal for how to do. Usually it's like fixed and arranged by the transplant center. Right. Thyroid, growth, mineral density, osteonecrosis, reproductive, or, or like they cover the patient from every aspect. So the next section will be on solid organ transplantation. This is like some slides also from ancient Egypt, like they were like a little bit advanced in surgery. Like this is on in the temples here, and this is like the actual ones. They have like artificial uh, limbs, and actually they have like a medullary nail here, so it's like one of the mummies. And they like they were good at denture, but they didn't invent the solid organ transplantation. <laughs> so solid organ transplantation, uh, I'm going mainly to talk about kidneys because like around 50% of the transplant uh, solid organ transplantation in pediatric patients are kidneys. So uh, of all renal transplants, around 7% happens in the pediatric age group, and usually in adolescent and in children from 6 to 12 years. But it can happen in very young uh, kids. So, uh, of course, at any age level or at any, uh, like, uh, disease stage, the three-year survival of patients following a diseased donor or living donor, transplant exceeds the survival on the dialysis. So, by any means, like, the transplant is better than the dialysis. So, the most common indications for renal transplantation is uh, congenital anomalies like aplasia, hypoplasia, dysplasia. Obstructive neuropathy, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis is the most common three indications. And of course, the immunosuppressive therapy, as we said, like 50%, like all the patients need long-term immunosuppression. 
like lifelong. So 50% is like uh, sacrolimus and mycophenolate, mofetil and prednisone, like 50%. But sometimes patients will not tolerate this one, so it's replaced by azathioprine. Corticosteroids is the essential, but uh, now with using the TAC and MMF have raised the possibility of corticosteroid withdrawal or avoidance from the beginning uh, because to avoid the long-term complication of steroids. Outcomes like uh, acute rejection rates have declined in recent years from like around 50% when the first invented to now like 16%. So the acute rejection now is like uh, less common than before. And of course, it's like a lot of variables depend on the, uh, is it like a deceased donor versus lived donor, more with the deceased donor, uh, more with the African Americans, more if there's like mismatches in the HLA, especially DR or, of course, if there is, like, no induction therapy. And, uh, of course, if you have more than five lifetime, uh, lifetime transfusions well, after the fifth one, yeah, the uh, risk for acute rejection increase. So the reversal of acute rejection is still not very successful. Like, as we said, like, 16% will develop acute rejection, and around half of them will be reversed. Like, more with the lived donors, more than the deceased donors. So uh, like around 4% uh, percent of the living donor, donor and 6% of the deceased donor recipients develop uh, graft failure and this. So from the confer confirmed graft failure, still chronic rejection is the most common. So chronic rejection is, is common, more common than the acute rejection. Like the chronic rejection happens in 41%, and there is like other causes of the graft failure, something like acute rejection, as we said, like only 7 per 6 to 7%. Graft thrombosis, uh, like the, the vessels in the graft get thrombosed. Disease recurrence, like original disease can happen again in the transplanted kidney, and uh, this was functioning graft from other complications, it's like 8.6. But still, the most common uh, cause of graft failure is the chronic rejection. The probability that a graft will survive at years one and five, like estimated to be 92 and 79 for living donor and 83 and 60 for disease donor. So we have, like, there is some discrepancy. Living donor is preferred than the disease donor, but depends on availability. But, like, 80% of uh, patients will have, like, a functioning graft uh, by age of five years. And, of course, the patient survival exceeds, like, 95% at five years. As we said, like, primary cause of this being infection. So infection is the most one, and graft failure is the second. And then there is another cause, like, cardiopulmonary disease and cancer due to immunosuppression. So again, infectious complication, same thing. Now you have like lifelong immunosuppression, so you are prone to viral bacterial infections. And as you said, like this is, comes after the rejection. And this is what's called BKV virus. It affects like, it lives in 90% of general population, but it's like an important cause to cause uh, late kidney graft loss. CMV can be a problem also and can cause like chronic rejection. Long-term issues, like many, kidney, many pediatric kidney recipients fail to reach their normal general adult height. And of course, if the transplant is a little bit earlier, it's, it, it's like before six years of age, it gives you better results. So baseline renal function is an important factor. You know, like the kids with renal failure, they have like uh, uh, something, you do uh, low growth hormone. And of course, the effect of corticosteroids will add to this. So treatment with recombinant human growth hormone and decrease as possible the doses of corticosteroids or to avoid it at all improves the condition. So it's like hyperlipidemia, hypertension, obesity, and nuanced uh, diabetes, it can complicate the transplantation mainly because of the immunosuppressive drugs like prednisolone and the other drugs also uh, like uh, sarcolimus. This can, can give you like side effects from like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and this may affect the outcome in the children. So post-transplant malignancy has been increasing progressively with most, uh, like, uh, as we said, like, most of them are related to EBV. And as we said, like, EBV lives in, uh, like, 90% dormant, 90% of population. It gives you, like, mononucleosis. But in immunosuppressed kids like those, they can develop, like, lymphoma and severe problems. Other risk factors being age younger than 18 years old. Other risk factor for uh, like long-term issues, it will be like less, if you are less than 18, white race, male sex, and prolonged immune suppression. 
So uh, medication non-adherence, like it, uh, it happens in 6% uh, of patients, especially in adolescent patients, especially because a lot of these medications have like hirsutism and gum hyperplasia. So especially if you have an adolescent, adolescent patient, they like, okay, so I will stop taking my medication. It gives me a lot of facial hair, gum hyperplasia. That's a significant problem. Like it's now found in like, 32% uh, of patients, like around 30 patients are non-adherent and six of them will develop like rejection because of non-adherence. So this is a big deal. So uh, for other organ transplants, like of course we have like liver transplants, usually for biliary atresia or acute hepatic necrosis, metabolic disease. There is like uh, heart transplant also for congenital disease mainly and cardiomyopathies. And uh, lung transplant for cystic fibrosis, congenital heart disease mainly, and uh, primary pulmonary hypertension. So this is a graft versus host and host versus graft. So sometimes it's confusing. So graft versus host, uh, uh, this is like if you are going to uh, transplant like stem cells. It's like the hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Tolerance develops by time, and there is no need at all for long-term immunosuppression unless chronic graft versus host disease develops. So you are giving the donor cells, and now the donor cells are like attacking the recipient's organs. As we said, like the acute will be skin, GI, uh, and the chronic it can affect anybody. It looks like systemic lupus. But usually tolerance happens, and it's not a big deal. Here, unless it's like chronic. Here, the host versus graft, it's like what's called the graft failure. Like what happens, like the, uh, the recipient immune system is attacking the donated organ. Like if you have a kidney transplant, so you, the, the recipient uh, are, uh, lymphocytes are attacking this kidney and this will give you the, the rejection. It's like only with solid organ transplantation, no tolerance developed, and it's long, like life, li lifetime immunosuppression. So uh, this will be the last section in the talk, so the role of general pediatrician. So just, this is a temple in Egypt it's called City uh, First at Abidus. So it uh, looks like any other uh, Egyptian temple, but there's like something interesting here. So if you do like zoom out on this one in the temple, you'll see this. So the temple was built around like 3,000 years ago and was discovered like at 9, 1848. Do you see anything specific? Yeah. And the tank, it's like a helicopter here and the tank and spaceship. And nobody knows what this, maybe something will come in the future. <laughs> so there is a scientific explanation for this, but this is not our role as general pediatricians, that's the Egyptologist's role. So if anybody is interested, I will tell you what is the, <laughs> what is the explanation after the talk. So what's our role as a general pediatrician for, what's our role as a general pediatrician for those vulnerable, like very challenging patients, very fragile patients? So first of thing, like, we need to understand the principles involved in the transplantation, what's graft versus host, what's host versus graft, and this is the main indication for this talk. And uh, what are the medications used in the immunosuppression, uh, how, uh, what, what are the complications that we anticipate. So this is like a huge list of complications. Like for this one, acrylimus, it can cause high, hypertension, it can cause neuropathy, it can cause renal dysfunction, like use it for renal transplant patients. But the medication itself can cause like azotemia and a lot of problems. Hyperglycemia, diabetes, uh, hyperkalemia, hyperlipidemia, a lot of things. And mycophenolate also can give you like GI problems like diarrhea and can give you like the problems in the CBC like leukopenia, anemia. It can add to the sepsis risk, of course. Uh, it can induce cytomegalovirus, CMV, viremia. It's a little bit uh, more common in patients on mycophenolate mofetil. And of course, lymphoproliferative disorder, it can increase it a little bit. So prednisolone, where that's like the steroids, you know, like peptic ulcer, fluid retention, steroid myopathy, protein catabolism, and like in bird wound healing, nistral irregularities, cataracts, and glaucomas. Azathioprine can replace mycophenolate mofetil, but still it has like some, uh, like leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, bone marrow suppression, and uh, increase the risk of infection and neoplasia. So, uh, the second role for general pediatrician, like you need to diagnose and to treat the common, common illness. Like those kids will have flu, will have like uh, throat infection, will have gastroenteritis. So you need like, and you will be like the first line. So as a pediatrician, we need to know when to treat them, when to refer them, what's the wrong thing. So, but you are the, the first line. So be aware of the timeline of the rapidity of the referral. 
and of course know what are the red flags for organ rejections. Like for example, if you are having a fever that's not improved in the first 24 hours, so maybe it's not just a rhinovirus that you diagnose, maybe it's like something else happening with this vulnerable patient. So if you have failure to improve uh, in the first 24 hours, or if there's like persistent fever or recurrent fever, or if there's like high elevated white blood cell count, or if there's like recurrent somatic complaints, like unexplained nausea or abdominal pain that can, it's not explained by the working diagnosis, or of unexplained organ-specific lab. Usually this patient needs lab. Like if you have this patient, it's better to do a CBC and CMP to know what's happening with the kidney function, what's happening with the CBC. Is this leukopenia, leukocytosis, is this like anemia, unexplained thrombocytopenia. So if there's like any of those, like I think the, the best uh, approach is like to contact the transplant team at the earliest possible time and expedite any necessary next steps. Because, you know, this patient can, like, develop overwhelming sepsis in very short time. So also you have to support and explain and comfort for, uh, offer comfort for the families. As we said, like, non-adherence is, like, it happens in 30% of adolescent patients. So you need to talk to them to tell them, yeah, I, uh, it can cause some side effects, but, like, it will avoid a lot of over uh, long-term complications. And then to support them, maybe they will need, like, some uh, psychology, uh, referral to psychology or psychiatrist. So this is our, uh, one of our duties. So, of course, like, be careful for, with drug interactions. Like, the, if you are in, like, uh, polypharmacy drugs, sarcolimus uh, and mycophenolate, phenazolone. So some uh, uh, medications like increase the plasma levels, such as erythromycin, erythromycin. Not the azithromycin is not that much, but better to avoid it. Some antifungals, some like calcium channel blockers, uh, and other uh, like some cyclopromide. This can also uh, all increase the levels of the plasma levels of uh, sarcolimus. And there is like medications that can decrease, such as like cephalosporin, which commonly we use them. So we need like maybe touch base with the uh, with, uh, transplant center before starting the veneer or something for them or their generation cephalosporin. So, uh, and I think the last one we have is uh, vaccination. So vaccinations uh, are not uh, like for the kids, the kids with renal transplantation and their long term uh, uh, immunosuppression. Usually, like uh, the LIF uh, attenuated virus, uh, vaccines are uh, better to be avoided, like varicella, rotavirus, measles, mumps, rubella, PCG, smallpox, and astro. So we have two quizzes. So the first one here, they're talking about seven years old girl with homozygous sickle cell anemia, underwent stem cell transplantation from unrelated uh, HLA identical donor seven months ago. She has been complaining seven months ago. So she has been complaining of fatigue for two weeks and now has developed a feeling for her mouth being dry. On physical examination, she has wide, widespread nonspecific rash over the trunk and arms and no cyanosis, no jaundice. She has shoddy anterior cervical nodes but no other significant adenopathy and no fever was mentioned. So the most likely cause of her symptoms is A, B, C, D, E. D. Do you like EBV? So we have Dr. Ms. D and Dr. Atkinson B. Anybody else? That's B. So it's like six months, it's seven months, and it looks like systemic lupus because you have fatigue and this rash. So it looks like so the chronic graft versus what Actually, EBV is like very good uh, thought, but it usually does not cause rash. So I think I'll go with <laughs> Question two, uh, which of the following statements about renal transplantation is true? The most common cause of gra renal graft failure is associated chronic rejection. So, yeah, survival after transplantation of kidneys from a diseased donor is shorter than survival. This is wrong because, uh, as we said, like, uh, whether like diseased donor or left donor, both of them have much better prognosis than dialysis. And post-transplant uh, malignancy is a problem of other nodes. It's like the same. 
it, it, it happened with <coughs> children, and of course, non steroidal non steroidal drug has nothing to do with uh, this. Is my reference, a lot of guidelines. If anybody wants the presentation, I can send it to them. Time for questions. I have more of a comment. We are always available to help you guys with this stuff, so um, feel free to contact us before the transplant center or both, but um, we can be the conduits for that. Um, the other thing is we also have, because you guys are the ones who do this, I have a list of post, at least bone marrow transplant, recommendations for immunization schedule, re-immunization. So if you ever need any of that information, just feel free to call us. Thank you. It was a great talk. Thank Can you give us an update on chimerism, or did that come up with, you know, in the in the uh, case of solid organ transplantation? I know a lot of centers have actually had um, success. Uh, there's protocols, I guess, <laughs> but um, I don't know if you, in your reading, if you came up like on... Like the haploidentical thing? Well, basically, yeah. The, 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 I know that there are protocols in terms of transfusion protocols and other sorts of things where you see... I know Pittsburgh's been a leading uh, kind of observation where they actually come off of all immunosuppression, um, which is desirable. I know you want to get off some of the more serious immunosuppression, but there's certainly case reports. What I don't know is where the state of, of the art stands in terms of inducing chimerism or protocol, and maybe our hemonc folks know. Yeah, so I, like well, while I was researching on this, I, I came through some of them, but it was like very advanced, <laughs> so just I read about them, but... It's like being on the scope of this. I can speak for, again, bone marrow transplant, hematopoietic stem cell transplants. There are a lot of non-malignant diseases now where we are accepting chimerism. So he mentioned, you know, haploidentical transplants and those result in chimerisms that give you enough of normal um, stem cells to overcome the disease process without, and they're still working on this, but um, without giving you the toxicity that you would expect with a, a chimeric marrow as opposed to a fully matched marrow or fully engrafted marrow. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, related to that, I, I mean, I have a patient who's a liver transplant <laughs> that, uh, you know, she was a, a living-related transplant. Uh, she's now almost 10, and primarily because of, you know, uh, the psychosocial problems. You know, lost follow-up, things like that. Genesis came off of immunosuppression and has never had a, a re she had a little bit of CMV post-transplant in Baylor, she's done a Baylor, but has not been on immunosuppression. And it, it's stunning. You know, it does, there are numbers of case reports of that, but it's obviously immune chimerism that's occurring. And of course, I'm sure the closer you are to the HLA kind of thing, the better. But it, this is a solid organ like your renal mm -hmm. recipients. I don't know if there's any way to predict. Better. I really don't know for solid organ transplants, but that's what they're looking at for sickle cell disease, and it's um, it's a very hot topic right now in our world because you know there's a lack of donors, which is a big problem. So, Eli, you had one thing in your slide that was interesting to me based on our journal club yesterday from the NICU mm -hmm. that the that the risk of failure. Um, for kidney transplants went up significantly if you'd had a lifelong five blood transfusions? Like the risk of acute graft rejection increase if you have like more than five transplants. Yeah, five, five tr transfusions or transplants? I think it was talking about the uh, kidney, kidney transplant, right? Yeah. So I think it's more than, if you have more than transplants. Uh, let me double check it. Transfusions, yeah. Yeah. So I guess my question is, because uh, of the theme why? B, I think maybe that like if you have like more transfusions, it's like maybe it will induce like more uh, incidence of infection of CMV, or sometimes also like I think we do the irradiated one to kill the lymphocytes to avoid the graft versus host, but not in maybe not in this, not 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 in the kidney, maybe it's in the uh, stem cell transplantation. So I think maybe it's like mainly the CMV and EBV virus. Great talk. Thank you. Um, with regard to the transfusions, it's my understanding that it's the exposure to the minor blood group uh, 
antigens that sensitizes the okay. lymphocytes so that you have a higher likelihood of um, developing uh, rejection when you've been transfused. And I never knew there was a specific number, but, but I did know that the more transfusions you've had of RBCs, the more likely you are to reject, and, and it's, um, uh, it's related to the minor antigens. Yeah, and maybe you could update. There's two two things. One is, and because it has relevance with the renal transplantation, I know that the Pittsburgh folks were kind of pioneers with this, but uh, now they're hepatitis C. Uh, they're actually using hepatitis C positive donors hmm. because the tr antiviral therapies post transplant are so effective. That even though it used, that used to be an absolute no-no, that you'd never transplant a Hep C oh. into a patient. So it, it's kind of stunning, but the, it gives us an idea of where we're at with antiviral therapies in 2019. Very encouraging. So that's a, that's certainly a positive thing. The other thing I was going to uh, you know ask was in terms of, and Dr. Atkins could probably answer this, absolute contraindications to, to solid organ transplantation. You know, it used to be kind of blood group and other things specifically. Are there any absolute contraindications in terms of matching, uh, you know, in terms of uh, things like that, or no, not really? All organs? I mean, I got <laughs> Anybody want to take a swing at that? <laughs> Rabies, <laughs> yes. I <laughs> have some experience with liver transplants from hepatoblastoma, which, by the way, I think we're going to be seeing more liver transplants because we're being much more aggressive with therapy for metastatic hepatoblastoma now, um, but it's mainly, you know, infections and recurrent disease in my world at least. All right. Any other questions or comments in the room? We've got a few minutes. I can unmute the phones. Uh, if you are on the line and you do not want to ask a question or make a comment, please place your phone on mute now. The conference is now in talk mode. Hey, does anyone on the line have a question or comment? Go once, going twice. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks Excellent so talk. Much.